Hello and welcome to Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. I'm your host Nicholas McKay and today I'm joined by Tara Perry, founder of BlackPack.org, whose purpose is to restore economic and political unity in the black community. Welcome to Conversations, Tara. Thank you for having me, Nick. Where were you born originally? Uh, I was born here in Los Angeles, California. I was raised in the Valley. Um, I went to school at El Camino High School. And um, I spent, uh, well, I have relatives who live in Los Angeles too, so I spent a lot of time in South Central um, growing up. So it's my second home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then so Woodland Hills or the Valley mm -hmm. and to South Central. And mm -hmm. how was that kind of difference already, like early in life? Oh, it's very <laughs> different. Um, you know, we would go there probably about every weekend to see my like my mother's siblings and my cousins, and they're, they're like my other siblings, so like mm -hmm. we're all very close family. But growing up, I didn't un I didn't notice why there was such stark differences in mm -hmm. the way we lived, but I just it was very noticeable as as a kid. Um, my cousins would go to school, and whenever they would um, like visit us, and like they had new shirts on of somebody else, rest in peace, and another kid. And oh, wow. They had tons of friends who died at early ages and just very young. That did very much disturbed me. So, right. Yeah. So was that and so who were your earliest influences then? If that was a very distinct change, but did you get both influences? Mm -hmm. what, who were your kind of? Uh, I had quite a few uh, uh, influences. Um, one of my mother's friends, uh, he gave me a book on Nat Turner okay. and um, the whole slave revolt, and it was a it was a kid friendly book, and it was like, oh wow, like this really happened. I was very aware. I was I was quite woke at a <laughs> young age, um, knowing a lot about slavery and things like that. Um, Rosewood. Um, uh, let's see, what's the other one? Black Wall Street, mm. uh, Tulsa. Oh, in Tulsa. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So, like, I had a lot of that knowledge and understanding that Black people had a certain plight, um, just in this country. Mm -hmm. um, my uncle Kenny, he really introduced me into politics. My uncle Reggie, he really introduced me to just the state of Black people in this country, mm -hmm. and really letting me know, like, as a Black person, you're going to be treated a certain way. Mm -hmm. Like, I was prepared to be called nigger by the time I went into school, you know? At so, what age do you think it was? Probably, what was that conversation? I remember it was Easter, I was about four years old. Oh, damn. Yeah. Very young. Yeah, very young. Very young. And so, you know, even be, before going into kindergarten. So, um, I, was, I, I wasn't called a nigger though until I was about fourth grade. So, wow. I think I did. I think but I still did fourth pretty grade. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But, <laughs> that's pretty yeah. Nice. So, so, was that, were those, were those the first time you kind of learned about race though? And kind of saw a distinct difference in, I guess, pe how people acted mm -hmm. or, or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah, I guess so, because, yeah, you're growing up around a bunch of black folks, so, mm -hmm. mm, well, so I was about four, so yeah, so pretty much my family was pretty much all I knew, but going to school in the Valley, it was very diverse, mm, and see, there were many, many races, and we even have other, other races in my family, I have white people in my family, mm -hmm. I have Native Americans in my family, um, but yeah, like I, we already knew how to deal with other people who sure. were not us, and a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to have that experience. So right, but so, yeah. So d it, that's very interesting that you saw both sides, and then I, I, I don't want to say like humbled to it, but you kind of have to be rather than one person in one side and one person in the other. You right. don't really get that crossover. Yeah, black folks, we learn to code switch very early in life. So. <laughs> code switch. <laughs> yeah. I think that's an NPR show too. Like, <laughs> Is it? Like, you know, I, I wouldn't know, but podcast yeah, we definitely we learned to code switch early. Like you have, you're you're a certain way at home and with your family, and I think maybe even immigrant kids may code switch to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Like they would speak another language in their household Very and then point, yeah. speak a completely different language um, uh, when they go to school and when they interact with other people. So who were so other than books? Um, did you have any other kind of influences? Was it more like? You know, I'm trying to reach, but like you know, Dave Chappelle comedy, you uh -huh. know, things like that. What were your other like? Uh, I would say Malcolm X, the okay, movie. Sure. Um, Denzel. Yes, Denzel. Wow. Absolutely. Three hours. <laughs> First off, Young Denzel wait, too. but as a kid though, you know how some kids watch movies like repeatedly. That was my movie. Oh, that was like, I don't okay, care okay. if it was three hours. Uh, so like that was my movie. Like interesting. I was one of those kids who were pulled out of school to go and watch that movie. Like it was that important to our community. Very yeah, it was. It was. Um, yeah, it was monumental. So. Well, so in, in something like that, like how has that changed over time? Because I'm assuming that like 
pulling your kid out to, for a monumental movie per se in, in middle school is not the same as here. It's almost like the culture is break, you know, breaking down like into yeah. the schools to, to show you some of these things. But then I, what is, what is that, how has that changed from your, from your earliest time to the now where black culture is very in front of your face, I yeah. guess you could say. Yeah, it's very uh, prevalent. The only, well, it depends on what you mean about black culture, right? Mm -hmm. Black well, I was more talking now. about media culture, of, yeah, uh, the content, like. right? But it, it's like it's still up to the powers that be who decide what they decide to magnify, sure. right? Because sure. some people will give Cardi B a more higher platform than a Nick Cannon or than a um, let's see who else or a Umar Johnson. I don't necessarily believe everything he believes, but he's a, he's also another black intellectual mm -hmm. or Yvette Carnell, Antonio Moore. These are people who um, are out here really doing black politics, but they're not getting the platforms uh, that Cardi B is sure, getting. Sure. So it's kind of, it's an issue when other, other people are in control of our narratives. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's still a problem, although black culture is prevalent and, um, um, and highly imitated around the world, it's not it's not our choosings. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's well, not, do you think we're that, not choosing what gets uplifted? No kidding. Yeah. And, and uh, well, even in the last couple of years, though, with with the uh, success of I want to say like Ava DuVernay, D DuVernay, uh -huh. DuVernay, uh, and then even I don't want to say like Tyler Perry, but like that. that I like th Tyler Perry. No, well. sure, but and he opened it up like in terms of production companies and Definitely. how they they film things and getting <laughs> those people into very critical. Um, jobs you know in the movie making industry but now you can really see that there's been some some switches in terms of like writers room they are getting more diversity more black women especially directors mm -hmm. and i'm not saying it's anywhere near where it needs to be but it seems like there has been a certain type of awakening in the media culture of it they're trying to get more narrative space if you will and i don't know if you have something to say that that maybe there's need to be more of that because what you were just talking about is almost gatekeeping. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So what, how, how do you really get around that? Do you create your own black art or do you do both that and, you know, do the black art inside the machine, if you will? Yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting because even doing the black art inside the machine, it's like you're you're in an echo chamber you know mm. a lot of times when we have certain conversations it's kind of like okay that's great but how do we bring everyone else with us you know our messages kind of get stifled and mm. you know like with the ados movement you get called xenophobic because no one wants to hear what you're saying but what ados is really doing is saying look we have to critically look at the way the united states is doing immigration mm -hmm. that's the issue sure. we're not xenophobic we don't want not want immigrants to come here we don't want we do not not want people to get asylum we want the united states to pay attention to their immigration practices sure. and how they're they're using immigrants to ignore the plight of the black community and repairing the black community you know so so those are the things that are um you know, it's very, it's, it's very disheartening because, especially in black media now, mm -hmm. they'll talk about ADOS, but they will never have an ADOS supporter on their show to come and have a discussion on what ADOS is. Like, that, that's another form of gatekeeping. Roland mm -hmm. Martin is notorious for this. He had Richard Spencer on his show, a KKK member or a... a Alright, the, the founder of the Alright, basically. Alright yeah. people to come and express his views, but you wouldn't speak to an ADOS person. Right. This is still another black movement, a black political movement, whether you agree or disagree with it. I think they're allowed to have that platform and speak for themselves instead of being uh, rife with um, propaganda. Mm -hmm. And people are just trying to negate that cause or that discussion. I think I think we, we need very... Um, complex or nuanced discussions about what's happening in black America. So, okay. but yeah. Very good point. And but, then, so just to kind of re ADOS is an American mm -hmm. descendants of slavery, just right. for anyone that's like not familiar. Um, and um, you can kind of go into this more, but basically the idea is that there are a ton of people in the United States mm -hmm. currently right now that are all descendants of American sl slavery, basically mm -hmm. it, that we did in the 1800s throughout till, you know, that, uh, 1619 it, until okay, 1865. So, 16, okay. mm -hmm. so then you, so tell us about like exactly what makes, you know, I guess like tell us just about the movement or of ADOS and then what is its main goal, I guess right. you could say. Um, ADOS is American Descendants of Slavery founded by Yvette Carnell and um, Antonio Moore. And it's really a political movement 
to really politically educate um, American descendants of slavery, just saying like we have a specific justice claim from this country, this country owes us reparations. When we look at every indicator of uh, quality of life, black folks are at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That is systemically implemented and it starts from slavery, from slavery to uh, reconstruction, Jim Crow, redlining, pr uh, convict leasing, prison industrial complex, and it's continued. Um, ADOS is about getting black folks on a certain, or getting us educated to a certain extent to where we do politics from this central place, and most importantly, gain our reparations, mm -hmm. because we'll never be made whole. We've been broken people, <laughs> and this country has specifically broken us. We're the only race that has been um, discriminated against through co codified law in this country. No other race. We need policy that is going to specifically heal us and fix us. So that's what the ADOS movement is about, and specifically, um, more directly, reparations. Because you can't fix you can't fix poverty with charity. You're just gonna put a bandaid over it. You can't even do politics if you are a charity. So, right. <laughs> so you you can't really do the real work to help these people or help us. Because the the the, the main thing is policy decisions and policy, policy outcomes and right. changes rather than narrative things or spouting off optics and things like exactly. that. Exactly. And it's like when you look at a lot of um, race conscious um, policies, I wouldn't even call them really race conscious, but even looking at Joe Biden's, um, I forgot what he called it, but the um, his supposedly black agenda, okay. if you read it, it's all about people of color and blah, 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 but it's like, no, America did not do this specifically to people of color. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I believe the Japanese, uh, they're considered people of color, but they make more money than white people. Like, economically, mm. this country did not specifically break these people financially and put them out of economic participation. We were, that was done to us specifically. We need specific redress exactly. for the harm that's been done to us. We've been economically locked out of participation. We've had resources removed from our communities. We've had crack thrown into our communities. Absolutely. <laughs> and the government did that. Yeah. So the government has a responsibility to fix us and not continue this benign neglect and act like nothing's happened and try to put a big old Band-Aid over everything and then just say minorities and then give a lot of those benefits to white women. Mm. It's not going to where it should go. Right, right. And then the, the, the fall of the money when you look at the actual charitable things, like it's not really ending up in the communities or, or ending up in the real decision makers. Uh, the one thing I wanted to ask you though is with reparations and, and, a, and such a history of slavery, mm -hmm. but then we live in the land of the free. How ironic what do you mean is by that? that? No, well, no, I'm <laughs> oh, saying like, like people but I'm slave. saying, yeah, yeah, because okay. the, the land of the free, the United States of America, like this American exceptionalism narrative, mm -hmm. you know, that everyone gets fed into with the United States kind of uh, history books and et cetera. I've seen a movement to change from that, but like one of the biggest things that people keep looking at is that we have not righted that wrong. And then our wrong, our country was founded on that wrong. And that's been a huge disconnect in people that have basically you know putting their heads in the sand and saying it wasn't that and then we we moved on from that right. because it was two generations ago but then others are saying no no no, we literally cannot move in an effective way until we do something about this so i just want to kind of talk or riff on that kind of irony that we live in the land of the free but then this is specific. <laughs> and then there are people enslaved but we're but we're based on a, right like, and not only was this country founded on on um slavery Slavery built the economic it, it, system that's of this more country. That I was kind right, of right, towards. right. It's like you've paid these people nothing for hundreds of years, and all of these people, the only people who were allowed to profit were white people. Yeah. That wealth continues to permeate through, throughout families, white families to this day. Generational Inter wealth. Um, generational sure. wealth. So it's like, okay, well, if you want to really say that, are you willing to give us what you owe us? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to for, 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 forego your current wealth level? To and equal write that, it out to or equal, do something. Not, not only to equal it, equal it out, if you're trying to say that, oh, it doesn't matter anymore, then this money should not belong to you. Then yeah. this should go to the bank of the blacks, and we will take that money. <laughs> and we will put it and, towards something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. if you, you shouldn't be, then, then you shouldn't be allowed to pass things down. How many of you own, um, live in a family house that maybe your great grandparents purchased? We were we were blocked from even owning property. Oh, like, right. so. and we'll get into that. Red <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Stuff for okay, sure. so I won't I won't jump ahead, but we, you know, 
that really exists in, in the white community and a lot of people don't acknowledge that. So we mm -hmm. have to also look at the amount of wealth that black people have built for this country. Mm -hmm. As, as we built it, we were locked out of participating in it, especially after we were um, set free in 1865. Black folks were the original homeless people. You release all of these people from plantations, mm -hmm. They're wandering around, they're trying to find Isn't somewhere that what to go. Vagrancy, and then, a vagrancy, vagrancy, then vagrancy whatever. laws yeah, and all yeah, that. And of totally. course, the uh, the 13th Amendment, which provided a loophole for slavery. Um, oh, well, uh, no person could be made a slave unless they've committed a crime. Convicted of a crime. So <laughs> now you're making every, like the very existence of blackness a crime to put people back in, to put people in prison just to re-enslave them. It's just slavery mm -hmm. by another name. Mm -hmm. So that continues to this day. It's funny because when I was a kid, um, I, I forgot I was watching a movie and remember when they would have a, a, a prison shot, they're all making license plates, you know, oh, or sure. something like okay. that. Okay. And I was like, isn't this like slavery? Like I was very young and made that connection. Right, right. And I had no idea about the 13th Amendment at the time. But that's like, yeah, that's still slavery. Companies are participating in the prison industrial complex and making money off of these people. So lots of yeah, money, lots not, of not, money. Not just small pickings. Either. Right. So we have to make sure we look at the economic aspect of what was created, the wealth that was created by the slaves in this country. Yeah, and then especially when you look at things like, um, like Watch Watchmen, you know, and then to, I've and, yet and, to see that, okay, but well, I've heard it was. That's how. Good. Um, not like I knew vaguely about like Black Wall Street and Tulsa and stuff, but that I didn't know exactly. And then watching that and seeing that visually. They basically start the, the series off by like a shot that it was like amazing place, blacks were doing their thing, and then all of a sudden like through race and et cetera, Jim Crow laws, you know, basically mm -hmm. that was like blown up. Um, and it was pretty tragic to, to see that, that like the one, you know, place of light, if you will, was snuffed out as soon as, you know, it starts getting to go. Yeah. And wh what I wanted to talk to you about now is basically like, Going back to, so you left Los Angeles and went to St. John's University. Yes. What did you study? And then like what, and we'll, we'll get to basically linking, you know, your previous thought to now, but like, okay. let's, let's go back to what, why, why St. John's? Why did you want to, you know, start doing whatever you were doing, you mm -hmm. know, and take us through kind of that. Yeah. Um, let's see. So when I was here, I was in a community college and I was going to major in African American studies. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't say I'm boring, but it was just like, what am I going to do? I don't want to necessarily be a professor. I don't want to really have to go get a PhD to do something. Mm -hmm. And I take an elective course and I took sociology 101 and I loved it. I felt okay. like it was much more encompassing. Like I felt that African-American studies was just more so about the history and literature of, of black authors and things like that. But it was, it really tapped on the condition of black people. Mm, okay. And of course, all people and how we're socialized a certain way. Mm -hmm. So that's what really drew me to sociology and then doing statistics and doing our own research. Um, it just really called to me, so I appreciated it. And, and we had to take criminology and so it was, it. I felt like, and of course, gender and race studies. So I felt like it kind of touched on a lot of the different conditions in our society. And then so through that kind of, and I want to be cliche, and that mm -hmm. baptism of, of like kind of knowledge, if mm -hmm. you will, you did that one way with Uncle Reggie and Uncle, uh, you know, yeah. before, but then you go to college and specifically, how did that change once you came back though? Because obviously we're all young and et cetera when you go to college, but then, and then you know, you try new ideas, you try new philosophies. Yeah. But then how was that difference when you came, when you came back to LA? I, I want to see the difference yeah, in that. Yeah, I mean, I've always been a, just a matter of fact, how like it is person. But now I had a better, um, like historical context. Mm, like okay. I could see why people acted a certain way. I like I know people who've been locked up, who've been institutionalized. I was able to kind of pinpoint your experience in some certain types of trauma or um, this is because you've been socialized in mm. this manner. Like I learned to not take things so personally, honestly. Mm. It kind of helped me as a person to be able to remove myself from the situation and actually kind of um, acknowledge or not acknowledge, but um, analyze mm. not only the person, but the situation and why it's happening the way it's happening. And just certain conversations or just certain interactions or even, even crime for that matter. You know, I had a friend who, um, who, uh, he mentioned something about, um, 
oh, well, if someone just broke in your house and stole all your Christmas gifts, are you going to tell your kids like, oh, well, they're poor, you know, they should have it. And I said, yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> I, counterintuitive for yeah, him. Kind of counterintuitive because it's like, look, we can't, if we're not going to sit here and fight for people to have equal housing, um, uh, living wage jobs, we can't really complain about the crime that's happening. Yeah. You know, everyone is so uh, concerned about the aftermath of crime or the, the symptom of poverty. It's a symptom of poverty. Why, don't, why aren't we addressing the poverty? Like Absolutely. that's kind of how I started looking through life. And I feel like a lot of people aren't fortunate enough to do that. So. And how much empathy though was that? Because obviously you mm -hmm. empathize with the people that are going through that, like you just said, mm -hmm. hey, if the conditions are there, you know, someone will make a certain thing, but I'm assuming you even empathize with other people that maybe not necessarily racist, but empathize with people who didn't see your way and that you could see like how they went that way or, or so, like how is that empathy kind of, mm -hmm. not just with people that believe in the same things that you did, but then maybe for other people who were opposite. Right. right. Um, let's see. I wouldn't say I empathize with yeah, yeah, I mean, but, um, you can do some disclaimers. No, That's like <laughs> I... I understand the plight of white supremacists to a certain extent. Um, when you see the country's changing and it's different from what you're used to, and in their privilege, they don't understand why they had it so well. Mm. These people had to be oppressed for you to have it so well. Mm -hmm. But in their in their selfish in their selfishness, they don't want thing to ch things to change. They're mm -hmm. afraid of change, and they are used to being the first ones for a job or being able to invest and not competing with other right, people. Right. Now they're seeing black folks are kind of raising up, not really, but immigrants even are r raising up and creating certain competitions for them. They feel like they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I can empathize in that manner, but I think people need to step back and acknowledge their privilege also. So I can I can I can be I can be empathetic, but I, I can be critical. No, I, <laughs> yeah. I like that, and I, I more so I was more going along the lines of like what this uh, I can't remember uh, what she she's a thinker Bonnie DeVarco I think she said making the invisible visible, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like these things are invisible until really like you get it, you know, something happens, something changes, and until that happens, well, how are you, you know you can't tell an ignorant person they're ignorant. Right, it's yeah. like against like the don't definition. Know. They already don't know. <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's fun. It, I just I'm kind of trying to see like how your thought process of going away to college, but then also being very cognizant of race and stuff like that, and then coming back to Los Angeles that is going to be moving very slow, possibly. Or like, what did you see? Because when you came back, I I I, I want to see like, is, was there a difference or not at all? Okay, you know? so when I came back from college, I, my family still lived in the Valley, and so I was here in the Valley. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I wouldn't say that that shock really hit me until I moved to Los Angeles. I got very active with Black Lives Matters, we're on the Rapid Response Team, and it was a, a trek, and it was like, look, if people are getting killed, we need to be there quick, quicker, you mm -hmm. know? So we moved to Los Angeles, um, uh, my partner at the time, and it was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I was able to really see the way the local politicians were not doing anything for the local people, um, how black people were um, overcharged for certain products. Uh, we got less um, community service. Okay. Uh, or not community service, customer service. Like when you go to Rouse, oh, for I example. See, I see, I see. When you go to Rouse, for example, you have to, if you go to get your fish, they will weigh it for you, bag it for you, give you the tag. You have to go pay for it yourself and walk back to go pick up your fish. And I was like, this is crazy. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you go to every liquor store, they charge you 75 cents, which is almost a dollar, to swipe your card. Yeah. Yeah. That's not in Willow Hills. Yeah, I've, I never, see it, I see I've never paid a transaction fee. Yeah. And not only that, the cities are much more um, populated. Mm. So you're you're just racking in so much fees from um, just just for the fee f to use their card. So it's like you're being further taxed for being poor. Yeah. Further taxed for being overpopulated. And and I and to a certain extent, I understand why some of those fees exist because there's more risk, um, because there's more poverty and there's more crime and there's more theft. But you know. I just don't, I just felt like those were just responses to the existence of poverty. Yeah. I think and at what point do we start sure. uh, um, addressing that? Well, so, so, 
in the, in the poverty aspect, like how has that changed also with you? Because you have a four year old son. He's you, five. Now. Five. Oh, he'll now. be okay. six in October. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so how has that changed? I mean, I'm assuming have you already had that conversation with him, <laughs> or that Uncle Reggie had with you? Yeah. How has that kind of changed now that you're a mother? You know, and now mm -hmm. you're uh, active in the community more so. You know, it it puts so much more fear in my heart. Mm. Um, I made the mistake of watching Fruitvale Station when I was pregnant. I wish I watched I'm it before. Familiar, so. uh, Fruitvale Station is the uh, movie of Oscar Grant, who was killed in the okay. subway station in um, in Oakland, okay. where um, Kamala Harris was the DA at the time. Um, yeah. Just a little quick note. Yeah. You know, quick note. Just put that out. <laughs> so he's killed by the police. Off. He, he's killed by the police, and I don't believe they did time. I think it was two cops who were involved in the shooting. My facts could be wrong. Please don't quote me if they are. <laughs> um, but basically, like, did little to no time. I think maybe seven months in jail, oh, I wow. think. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but watching the movie, they walk you through uh, Oscar's life as just a person. And just, you know, he lived with his mom, and he was dating a lady, and they go on a date. Oh, like humanizing. Like humanizing very, very him. Just showing, yes. Yeah, I and you. it's like, um, my, and... Well, you know, no, Black Lives Matter did not did exist. It? Yes, Black Lives Matter did exist. But in watching the movie, it made me fear to have this child. In the movie, there's a scene where the mother goes to claim her son's body. Oof. And she is reliving her, her birth of her son and his childhood. And I just cried. Like, oh, wow. I just cried. I'm, I'm not going oh, no, yeah. to cry. So <laughs> I just cried because it's like, what have I done in bringing this black child into this world right. or into this country? Right. So that really um, helped spark and really get me into gear like, no, this will not stand. If we do nothing, I leave this country to my son the way I found it, and I refuse to do that. Right. And it's an opportunity for growth. It's an it's opportunity, for, opportunity. To, for them to give their subjective kind of expertise and skill set to us. and figuring out this problem. Absolutely. Because it's systemic, like you said. It's not, it's around every other nook and cranny until you almost like burn it through, you know, mm -hmm. or, or start fresh or et cetera. That's not really going to change. Because these little changes are band-aids over cancers, it seems like, yeah. they, they're kind of going around. Yeah, it's like, at what point do we gut it? Mm. You know, let's not just, oh, let's not just give the poor food stamps, let's actually give them living wage jobs. Right, right, right. <laughs> so they can't afford food and where they live, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when I when I moved to when I moved to um, the city, I'm trying to think. Well, there were like no jobs. It was so difficult to find a job. And I went to paralegal school. After I came back, mm -hmm. I went to UCLA, and jobs wanted to pay me seventeen dollars an hour. Right. And I was like, I just got into sixty-five thousand dollars of debt. This is really bad math. At what point right, does this right. degree pay off? You know, it really opened my eyes to also the game of go to college or that lie. It's oh, like, no, sure. go get into further debt to, I made less money. I was, I was offered jobs of making less money than, um, than I had before I went to school. I got paid more per hour. And it's like, now you want to pay me $17 an hour. That makes no sense. You need a roommate to afford on $17 an hour. You would need a roommate who makes the same to be able to afford a one bedroom apartment. This is bad math and no one's paying attention yeah, to it. Right. Right. And it's really, the, it, and it shows that how housing, education, politics, like it's all together and mm -hmm. it's all interconnected. Right, so, but, but, and also really quick, yeah. when they think, I think, uh, I would, I would, no, I don't want to make excuses for the system, but when certain jobs think that they can pay you $17 an hour, I think it's assumed that you have certain generational wealth and that you don't need to make $35 oh, an hour. Like a, like, like a college you, kid. Like, like a college kid yeah, yeah, or, or something, something like that yeah, yeah, who yeah. has access to free housing with their mm -hmm. parents and or their parents left them a house and they only have to pay the property taxes once a year right. like or twice a year. So um, I, th I think it's all, it's so many disconnects that's not happening, and especially not for the poor. Right. They're not, um, the elected officials are not doing the work to make sure that poor people are no longer poor. How do we eradicate poverty? It's also difficult when you're in a system of capitalism. Capitalism requires poverty. Yeah. But a lot of people will try to mask it as something else and free enterprise and the ability to just freely make money, but no, it requires an exploited class. 
And when you exploit people, you're gonna have poverty, you're gonna have crime, you're gonna have over policing and police brutality, and it just continues. Right, and it, you don't deal with the root cause. You don't deal with the root cause. Is, is, it's a system that feeds itself. Right, and then let's okay. Th there's a lot to unpack, and then like also we can go into a lot of different ways. But okay. I get I want to get this in here here because I think that this kind of shows. Sorry, that. I'm long-winded. No, 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 no. <laughs> I like it. it. I think our listeners will appreciate it as well. Is um is I did a. Uh, a uh, roundup for Juneteenth, and it was all about like you know anti-racism and stuff. And there was one of the charts that bleakly stood out, and basically it was U.S. Black White inequality in six charts. So income, the wealth, uh, or sorry, wealth, the median income for whites, one hundred seventy-one thousand, for blacks, seventeen thousand six hundred. Mm -hmm. That is a m and, giant, and that and, right there, wealth. We were yeah. talking about intergenerational. That's and that's not liquid. No, no, I've, less. no, no, no. No, I'm just saying liquid's less. <laughs> well, well, okay. Well, this is just from CNN, so I'm, I'm not right. even for sure. But, but yeah. the income, 71000 So a year, you know, 71000 And then for blacks, 41000 mm -hmm. Poverty or unemployment rate, 14.2%, uh, up to 16.7% for blacks. Mm -hmm. Poverty, 8.1% to 9.7% for, for blacks. And then COVID deaths, only 13% of the population uh, but accounts for 23% of the COVID deaths. For, for blacks. For blacks. And, and we're only 13% of the population. Right, right, right. right. And, and so uh, another issue with um, ADOS is, or not issue, like another thing that we're passionate about is we need a designation for people who are um, American descendants of slaves, right? Well, let's get into that. What right. exactly no, does I'm that mean? I'm just saying in regards to those numbers, right? Very good point. Um, uh, American descendants of slavery, um, we're people who've been here for the last 400 years, right? Our, our great, 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 greats were slaves, went through reconstruction and uh, Jim Crow redlining and all of that. These are, our family has been locked out of wealth. We've inherited poverty. Right. <laughs> so it's, so when they say black, they only mean racially black. That also, those numbers also include new black immigrants right. who come here, who are educated, who have, um, who are the elite of where they come from? Because it's expensive to come to, to sure. America, right? Immigration is not cheap. So they're counting those numbers with ADOS people. ADOS wants a specific designation for people who are ADOS because these numbers mask um, what, like, pretty, pretty much where we are. This, these numbers, this shows are, it shows it really higher. Is. So yeah, these right, numbers right, right, are lower. Right. So it really conflates our numbers and it makes it, it masks the failure of real ADOS people. We need to really see where we are and um, like in, in terms of progress, it, it kind of, um, I would say it, um, it's like, uh, it's, it's basically lying, showing that black folks are progressing more than we really are, and we're not. And if you look behind the veil of statistics, et cetera, yeah. then you if would you actually see an actual yes, truth. Yes, the Color of Wealth report, there was a Color of Wealth report done specifically for Los Angeles, uh -huh. and it was one of the first reports to actually um, separate immigrant blacks and um, um, American-born blacks. I see. The wealth level, the, uh, the net wealth level for um, at liquid, uh, for African Americans or ADOS people was two hundred dollars, and Black immigrants, Nigerians was sixty thousand dollars. Sixty thousand dollars. Yeah, that's. And they just got here. Not so, even comparable. Right, it's, it's not even comparable, <laughs> right? But these people, they get here based on education, while this country undereducates us. Right, right. <laughs> and right. doesn't fund our and doesn't fund our schools properly. So we're not saying we don't want these people here. We're saying you have to look at our numbers because then when you look at our numbers and see us for for what it really is, then you're forced to do something about sure. it. But when you put us all as just racially black and you clump those numbers together white versus black then Right, right, white versus black, mm -hmm. right? Then it looks like we're doing better. Even seventeen Even thousand that, yeah. is still a low number and it's terrible. Yep. But it still, it still doesn't show that here in Los Angeles, um, liquid wealth were worth two hundred dollars, right. and I, I believe uh, the other statistic is fifty percent of African Americans or ADOS people are worth less than a dollar. Mm. There was another study in Florida; they're worth eight dollars. Yeah, it's like those are real numbers. Like th that's what we really have to. Um, attack and it's it's just unfair well, so well, yeah. I, so i guess my next question and we we've briefly talked about this before um mm -hmm. would be then 
the mechanism to do that because mm-hmm. obviously people yelling at the social senses. media, et cetera. And well, so and my thing is that, is that do we have a national reckoning like the Germans did for Nazi Germany mm-hmm. after that, and then also South Africa did after apartheid with their reconciliation? We still haven't had that. Yeah. So is that what it needs to happen for that to even be visible? Mm-hmm. You know, because like again, like how do you get a national conversation around something like that that is not at the national level? You know, like yeah. if it's not at a national level with courts and backing and et cetera, X, Y, Z, one, two, and three, how it, are you ever going to get the wealth? Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't seem likely at all if people just keep doing the status quo, keep doing the status quo. Keep doing yeah, it. I mean, and it, it does. It definitely doesn't help when people are trying to stifle the voice of, of these movements, right? Mm-hmm. When we're trying to really push this forward. Um, I believe we got um, American descendants of slavery on the census. I filled out my census, but... It, this for 2020. Is a, for 2020, oh, okay. it, see, see. it for the first time does distinguish ah, between the two. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's one. So way. actual numbers will start coming. Hopefully, okay, okay. I, but if people fill them out right, right, we have a. <sighs> of course. Yeah, yeah. and we <laughs> and we have we have other movements of Black folks against it. There are a lot of Pan Africanists that feel like we are one and blah blah blah. And it's like I, see. I get it, and that's great in a real utopian world. But Black folks who are really trying to get reparations or even to get repair, right? The first step. I, I'm a paralegal. The first step in um, a lawsuit, you have to show standing that you have the right to sue. Yeah. You have to show that you have that you are a victim of oh. all of these different yeah. atrocities yeah. by this country. You have to show that your people were here. Um, way before 1960, in 1965, Immigration Act is when we really had the real surge of immigration from other countries. So, if your great, if your grandparents are born here, likely you're a descendant of slaves. Right, if you're right, a black person, right, right. you know. Um, so it's very easy, but there are a lot of people who are pushing for Pan Africanism, and so we have this in the black community. Well, but is that, but is that just a? Because it seems like me, as soon as I hear that, it seems like it's just a uh, like a normative definition distinction of like, like yes, philosophically, yes, we're all mm-hmm. together. You know what I mean? All you and I, like we're all brothers and sisters. We're right. all humans. Like, I mean, if you want to say that, like yeah, you know, panpsych- everyone well, uh, levels, is a descendant is of saying. Eve yeah, yes, exactly. to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so my thing is like, but in the policy, and when you're talking brass tacks of like what exactly are we wanting in terms of goals and then how to do that, then it has to come down to something like a reparations or like a ADOS or things like that. Right. I mean, we need everyone on our side. We need people to really see the numbers, like the numbers I gave you in regards mm-hmm. to the uh, Color of Wealth Report of Los Angeles. And we'll re- I'll link that in the yeah. show notes. Too. That report, we need everybody to know these numbers to right. understand why it's important to make the distinction. It's not about xenophobia. It's not about um, it's not about hatred of other black people. It's about we are doing poorly. When you go to prisons, these are ADOS black men. These are not Nigerian black men. These are not Ethiopian black men. And that is by design. Mm. Because the immigrants that they allow in, they're they're using them to 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 mask our failure. And well, they're very specialized. Yeah, yeah I see. They're what you're very saying. specialized, yeah, yeah. but I mean, like the con- the way the country is using them, ah, and we okay, need yes. and we need also immigrants to be in alignment with our movement too, because they should understand our plight and say, you know what? No, we need to show that that this that this specific ethnicity of black people are not progressing, and why? Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's about the country actually trying to you know act like their hands are clean, mm-hmm. and they're not. You owe us a certain amount of money. It's a minimum of $17 trillion. And that's just cash. Mm -hmm. We still need other reparative programs, such as um, lineage therapy. Uh, We need um, education, educational grants, and and healthcare. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that we need. Just a cash um, check is not going to uh, fix everything. But you owe us that money. And, <laughs> but and, you're going to take the you know, check. We're going we to cash, we'll that, cash check. that check. And we need that money because that's going to allow us to actually practice group economics. You know, a lot of other uh, communities are able to hold on to the money that they make because they produce a lot of things that they use. Mm-hmm. We don't have the money to actually produce. We only an, have enough money to consume. When people talk about how much money black people spend, but that's because 
that those are necessities. That's like our laundry detergent, groceries, mm -hmm. your rent, your mortgage, your car. You kind of need a car. Right, <laughs> you kind of need sure. a car. Yeah. But it's like beyond that, no, we're not really spending frivolously because we don't have that excess income. Yeah. We we don't have enough to produce to mass produce for our people what we need. And that's been a big thing that I've even known is like black savings. You know, like yeah. that's been a big thing for hundreds of What's years. What's a savings? Yeah, yeah it's all. Like, well, it's just like uh, save as much as you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. as much as possible, under <laughs> yeah. the mat, under the you know mattress, like anywhere right. that this bank account, that bank account. Um, but then again, when you start talking about that, it's not every. It's like saving. Saving is a luxury. Like yes, if if, that, no, if, I was, if I'm working one of these jobs that wanted to pay me seventeen dollars an hour, I'm a single mom. I went to college still, right. got a student loan debt, and have to pay eighteen to eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month for. Um, just an apartment, just here in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, for, yeah. Need a car, paying for childcare. Yeah. What's the savings? Yeah, exactly. It's ridiculous. That's yeah. kind of a privilege that people have that they don't pay attention to. Sure, sure. Well, then, so some of these privileges um, must have been enough for you to want to do something about this because this year <laughs> you basically wrote in. Uh, you were a writing candidate for LA City Council District Eight. Yeah. So District Eight is. The, notably, the Crenshaw District, mm -hmm. Limerick Park, or Limerick Park, excuse me. Limerick. Yeah, Limerick. Uh, Baldwin Hills, West Adams, kind of that area. Yeah. And, uh, like, you know, Nipsey Hustle is from around that area. Mm -hmm. He had his uh, flagship store there. Um, there's notably no African American women on the city council. Yeah. Notably. Uh, so, not just like what was your experience and like what were your goals, but how can we better represent the local community and politics moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, in, in like the story I was telling you about, like going to the grocery stores and seeing like the different treatment, um, I decided to, um, I was working at a nonprofit that specialized in helping black people get employed. And I was asked to run, well, not just me, there was an, uh, an announcement that was like, hey, there's a neighborhood council uh, meetings happening and they have some vacancies, like, is anyone interested in running? And I thought I about it and I was like, w while I'm here and I'm looking at these numbers of unemployment, like uh, black folks are 40% 40, uh, 40 underemployed, unemployed in the Los Angeles mm. area. So I was like, okay, well, how do I do something about it? So I decided to run. Secretary was open, I won that seat. But neighborhood council here, we're direct liaisons to um, LA City Council mm. from the community. We're supposed to take the demands of the community to LA City Council. And so I get in and I'm just noticing all the BS. I was like, wait, why are we talking about what the councilman wants, what the councilman said? I was. Why, like, what's happening? You're in the belly of the beast, though. Man, I was not, I was, man, I was so not expecting that. Was that the naivete? Or yes, like, what was that? No, oh. absolutely. It was like, I'm going to work for the people, and I'm just going to take, like, We're the demands this. of the people. We're <laughs> doing this, you know? I was like, what is happening? And yeah. I had to make an announcement. And they were like, okay, calm down, AOC. Like, I, you know, because I was very fiery. And I was like, this is not okay. And this is not the councilman's space. We're supposed to take the demands from the people to the councilman. Right. I was, it was this was like my first day, and they're looking right. at me like, "Will you chill out?" Um, so there was one time because I was uh, working for this organization, um, I asked uh, his aide because they come and they do a report at our meetings, and I asked her for um, an updated jobs report. Now his office, um, should I name him or no? Do oh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> okay, so our councilman is Marquise Harris Dawson, yeah. and so District he, Eight. Yes. District Eight. Yeah. So he, we asked for a jobs report because he helped implement the targeted local hire program, mm. which the targeted local hire program was supposed to give a, 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 an allotment of a thousand jobs specifically for black people because we had such high unemployment mm -hmm. in our community. So I asked, well, how many people have been hired just from this district, not even black, not white, just from this district, how many have been hired? We have 40% unemployment just in that district, right? Mm. So. She comes and gives a report and she goes, oh, we've hired over 600 people. I said, from this district? She said, yes. I said, from this district? And she's like, yes. And this is October. And so, and I pull up my phone because uh, he put an actual chart on his Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it said, total, the entire city has hired over 600 people. It was, it was like 635. And they've only hired from the district. It was like... 53 people. Mm. 
this is a misleading number. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm working directly with ex-cons and people who really need jobs and people who really are, are hurting. And Nipsey Hussle had just gotten killed. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people had jobs lined up or working with Nipsey Hussle and all that shuts down. Oh yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah, it was a drummer. big deal. Yeah, yeah, and sure. I was just like, this is not okay. Mm -hmm. And not only is it not okay, your lack of urgency is not okay for the situation. And mm -hmm. then you would come and mislead the people when giving your jobs report. But that was like that, that shining a turd kind of thing. Yeah. That, like showing you guys, hey, yeah. this looks great, but it's, it's like, not. Are you kidding me? I yeah. said, no, check receipts. I was like, I got receipts. And I was like really upset. I left that meeting. I was like, I'm running for office. I don't have no money. Like, <laughs> Like, we're doing like, this. I can't. We're doing this will this. not stand. And I was, you know, and it was like, if nothing else, we would at least have this conversation. Like, mm -hmm. you need to get on your stuff about. Can we curse? No, I'm all right. <laughs> okay, you need to get on your stuff about this targeted local hire program because people have applied. They're waiting, and right. you're you're giving out false numbers of how well you're doing. Why would you do that? And then you're upset about people committing crime. I had my friend Marcus who was getting stopped every day by the police. You know, he, he's looking for jobs, but he can't find work. And he has a kid to take care of. And he gets arrested because he's, he's got drugs on him. Yeah. This, is, this is the issue. We can't just keep popping folks for having drugs or selling drugs when we have elected officials who are in here playing games and giving us false numbers because they don't want us to do anything about it. So I decided to run. This was October. And it finally opened up in November. Yeah. And so I went, I went, and I filled out everything. I didn't know you had to do all that stuff. It was, it was a real um, like declare your candidacy. Yeah, de and all declare that your stuff, candidacy. Yeah. But I didn't know you had to go and get all these signatures in less than twenty days, mm -hmm. which is which the system in itself is rigged because you oh, have to have money to run. Yep. And it's like, look, if I'm an everyday person, I actually work a job. How am I supposed to get these signatures? You don't. <laughs> like, right. But, you know, I got enough signatures, but of course they disqualify. Mm -hmm. It was seven of us. It was seven of us trying to get on the ballot. Only one got on the ballot, the incumbent. So it was two of us who decided, forget this, we're still going to run. Mm -hmm. You know, people need to know what's happening. So I, I still I still ran and I got a lot of traction toward the end. But of course, like if I had the money, I would have I probably would have beat him, mm -hmm. you know, and he's someone who's in, only in office because he got seven thousand votes, mm -hmm. you know, because he ran. So the bar in of entry is not exactly it's, that crazy. Well, it's not that it isn't um, if you get 50 percent plus one. Uh, in the primary in LA City Council race, you win. You don't. You don't. There's no run. Oh, I see what you're yeah. saying. Okay. But okay. he ran in 2015, which was an off year for the presidential election. So it's a low turnout. Mm -hmm. Only 12,000 people voted, and he got oh, 7,000. Right. So you know, if I had enough funds, I could have. And I think in this this round, he only got 30,000. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there was enough funding and if I had enough time, but... Are you, you thinking know, about it next time? I'll definitely yeah. consider running again, especially if I can get the funding. But, you know, we definitely need more people, more young people to go out and, and run. There's, there's too much corruption in LA City Council. Right. But in regards to the black women conversation mm -hmm. or the topic, uh, only one in the history of LA City Council has ever sat on the... Sat, sat on a board was um, Jan Perry. She's the only black woman to ever mm. be elected to LA City Council. Wow. And of course, she termed out though. But and what year it. was that? Uh, oh. She termed out, I believe, in 2012. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so, so she, like 2000 then. to 2012. So it's yeah, but she's the only one. Yeah, right. But right. right now, we are not represented. And um, so we should be. Yeah. That, well, that's, that's one thing that, uh, like, is representation is one thing that we were talking about is like making the invisible visible and one of the things that you mentioned before is jobs and uh, mm -hmm. homelessness and that kind of like mix and so I'm gonna put out uh, one of these statistics according to the Los Angeles Homelessness uh, Service Authority black Angelinos represent over 40% of LA's homelessness population mm -hmm. and then again for a little bit of more background um, District 8, Lambert Park, uh, et, et cetera, is very close to the new Inglewood football stadium. Oh, yeah. So then let's tie in like that jobs where you were talking about, market, the, the jobs guarantee for the local job task force, or et cetera. Because mm -hmm. the idea is, is that this new stadium comes in, billions of dollars, you got to build it, but then who's going to build it? Right. People in the community? Out, out, out of state contractors, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then so one of the things to then get that stadium to go into Inglewood was all the support that all these local jobs would then come. And then you would have 
people from Wes Adams, people from Baldwin Hills working at that stadium. Right. And those, but then that hasn't necessarily transpired. <laughs> no, so. not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and especially through the target of the hire. So it's like even with the contractors, like they had to technically bid, and I believe you had to be local to bid on this project. But there was, uh, there is a contractor who is basically from like Oregon, mm -hmm. but they opened up an office in 90043 in, in the oh, zip code. Yeah. That office doesn't exist anymore. So it's like, right. <laughs> where's the real due diligence? Like mm -hmm. how, who's approving these uh, these contracts and who's making sure that these are real companies and not just a shell so that they can qualify exactly. to ap apply. Um, they're also um, claiming they can't find enough people. So they're hiring a lot of people from Orange County, mm -hmm. from other places and, and bringing in other contractors. There aren't, there aren't local people working on these projects. Even when I worked for the, the nonprofit, uh, there were there were people who had to actually go on construction sites and count the black people oh. and there were nearly none like right. you're not hiring from this community which is the last like predominantly black community right. in the area you have no black people you know they created a lot of loopholes and the target local hires not being enforced yeah and then that all goes back to again the politics of allowing it because yeah. then that's just corruption oh yeah they definitely whatever. turn a blind eye but it's like what are their how are they being punished uh, when they're when it's not being enforced, are mm. they being fined? Are mm. they losing money? Nothing's happening. And there's to no these transparency people. or due diligence of keeping up with that in right. the public interest. Right, but then this nonprofit has to actually come into existence to do that to work. To do that yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Why? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you have you created this program, this target local hire program? Um, why don't you have an enforcement arm in mm. your office? Right. What are you guys doing? Yeah, because if you think that you're going to have something without an enforcement arm, then how much? Yeah, it's a, a flood. right. Exactly. <laughs> how how effective is it going to be? Not. not and it's very. just <laughs> it's just fueling gentrification or getting people out of there. So yeah. Well, a great transition to gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, so how you and I met. Um, Basically, we were going to try and do a short film about Destination Crenshaw. Mm -hmm. um, basically, it was going to be, well, to give a little background, uh, Destination Crenshaw what is a $15 million MTA project to, quote, preserve black L.A. through art. But that has since turned into, as you say, rapid gentrification. So can we, can you tell us about kind of the project's origins and then what has happened since? Because I think that ties in also with the jobs, that ties in with the optics, the politics, everything is that like, it seems like a great idea. And even... Well, I don't know who said this was a good <laughs> idea. And, and like, and, and speaking honestly, because um, I work with a lot of people who were in favor of it at the time and their, their sentiments has changed. Um, but I was not living in the district at the time when, when, the, when the project was happening because they had a lot of hearings. But from, from, my, from my understanding is uh, Destination Crenshaw and the, the MTA project, it's cleared out because like, Crenshaw is our, our black business corridor. Right. It's cleared those out. How do you actually think that you're preserving black LA? You're not preserving black LA. Like They usually say the first signs of gentrification is an art gallery and a cafe. You're going to turn this into an art gallery to memorialize the black people that used to be here mm. because we're getting pushed out. The black businesses are closing and we're getting priced out of housing. Yeah, like, it's, it's, it seems like this MTA, like it, it came in as, well, they did it economically and fiscally through as a line. So, hey, we're going to connect this through the MTA system. Mm -hmm. But then how we're going to do it, then we're going to put it in the middle of Main Street, basically, and tear up all these things. And then also we're going to put art, which I was more along the instances of like murals and artistic and, you know, to show black art, which is great. But then showing that but not doing the policy, again, that's kind of like yeah. that Band-Aid over a cancer. You're not doing anything. And then again, specifically to the, your gentrification point, is that this was supposed to be a boon for, for black businesses in the area, in that business corridor. And what's happening instead are these people who are being priced out for then speculators or hedge funds or other, not maybe not hedge funds, but speculators of real estate, et cetera, to then get people to move in at higher prices in those you know things of black, or, uh, in, in that black corridor. So mm -hmm. just talk about a little bit more of how exactly that changed from like the idea was great, but yeah. then the, uh, maybe at the beginning, but then changed to Like nothing. even with MTA, they were supposed to give out certain grants for uh, businesses that were negatively impacted I by see. their okay, great construction, sure, right? Sure. A lot of people didn't qualify. Mm. They were able to deny people either for either not filing taxes or have no right paperwork or whatever, what have you. But it's like, 
then who created this process? Who did not acknowledge how the way some people may be locked out of, you know, participating in these grants, you know, even in Los Angeles, we're very um, undocumented uh, friendly. There are certain things that they will not bar you from if you are undocumented. They're not going to say, oh, well, if you don't have a social security card, then you can't participate in this. There, right. there should have been more um, more targeted regulations for the area. So those barriers of entry to and stuff like that. Tons like that. of barriers mm -hmm. for entry for those grants. So they kept that money. Right. <laughs> but then black businesses closed. So we were just kind of left hanging. And then now you see also, I think you mentioned uh, in the spring about how you're seeing more of an exodus of even people not living there. Like they've gone yeah. to move to say Lancaster or, or maybe uh, out in the west va or the very deep east va east east of Los Angeles yeah. or even gone to a southern or, state. Yeah, like even like Riverside and Riverside, stuff like that. That's, yeah, that's yeah. what I was trying to yeah. say. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. A lot of places stopped taking Section 8 and housing vouchers. Um, supplemental right. housing has kind of disappeared. Um, and even low income housing, the way the metric, the way it's, it's um, the way it's shaped is they do it based on the county's median income. Mm -hmm. But the median income in our area is thirty two thousand dollars. But right. the county's median income is seventy five. The affordable housing mm. <laughs> that the way they're negotiating these contracts when they're allowing people to do construction in our area they will require them to have affordable housing a, a certain amount. They'll, they'll negotiate how much affordable housing will be there. But their affordable housing is still pricing out the area right. because at 32000 a year, is, that's the median income. These people can't afford, still can't afford to live there. So they, still, they, have, they find themselves having to relocate. And it's on purpose. Even um, first-time homebuyer programs, they'll give you, um, they'll give you assistance for... Um, down payment for homes that are like 380,000 homes in South Central are going for 700,000 mm. so I can't even participate in the first-time homebuyer programs because those are also um, like even like the relocation is kind of double prong like they're helping expedite this right, right. you can't to get afford people out to get, get people, people out yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's like what am I supposed to do with three hundred eighty dollars <laughs> Eight three hundred eighty thousand dollars. I can't buy nothing. I can't buy a condo in this area. Right, right. So you know, it's kind of um, you know, it's I wouldn't say double fisting, but it's kind of, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's expediting the process definitely, and it's unfortunate. And a lot of people are not paying attention to what needs to be done, the calls that need to be made. Um, there needs to be affordable housing, and they need to do it based on the local area's median mm -hmm. income, not the county. Yeah, because then that could be definitely skewed to some other parts that are getting It's definitely more of that. skewed, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, so second part of that, uh, how we met, was first the Destination Crenshaw, but then after that we were going to try and do some type of event, kind of concert, uh, celebrating the life of yeah. Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, um, rest. Yeah, exactly, rest in power. Uh, but I wanted to read this event prompt um, yeah. that we wrote, and and like it's very funny that to, I read it yesterday, and I was like, man, like hilarious, <laughs> like to think back. But again, like it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that when when you try to do something, it just comes apparent. And then like now looking back at it, it's like it, it, this would be this would have been so interesting to have before the George Floyd's, the mm -hmm. Breonna Taylor's. And so it's a little long-winded, but, but I'll try to power through no, this. The purpose of Black Pack Presents is to edutain, education through entertainment, the black community. It is a political education for the public mass as a concert. Black Pack wants to reignite the political flames of the black community, taking them with the responsibility of getting back involved and facing them with the consequences of what happens when they're not politically engaged. Our neighborhoods are being gentrified. Our black men are overly incarcerated. Our neighborhoods have been stripped of resources to the point there is nothing left for our children and we aren't doing anything about it. We have the responsibility to transform our apathy toward politics and remember what our people have achieved in recent history. We want our message to be conveyed by the heavy hitters of hip hop to remind the public black voices matter, black money matters, and black votes matter. Mm -hmm. Bringing people, black people together to commemorate the memory and philosophies of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and Nipsey Hussle. So that, that was pretty ambitious. Yeah. But at the same time, along the through lines of what we're talking about is some type of mechanism. So what do you have as, as to say is that like, 
we talked a little bit about this, but what is black culture? You know, what is like black media, like Nipsey Hussle, all of a sudden shined a big old spotlight on, on District 8, mm -hmm. even though he did pass. There's a giant spotlight onto that that now we're talking about jobs, gentrification, you know, those type of things that maybe District 8 wouldn't have gotten that love. You know, yeah. and I'm not saying that, that he needed to die for that, but what are some of the things of black culture that needs to be pushed more into the mainstream? Um, like, and, and, you know, and I love Nipsey and the, and the work that he was doing and he was, because he was a self-made millionaire, you know, he, he, he had the resources to really do for the community. Mm -hmm. I wish everyone adopted his care and love for his community the way he had, you know, for, to stay there, to continue to live there. To open up to his open flagship up his business, store yes, there. Absolutely. absolutely. And it's like to show these kids that you can do it. I think that's wonderful. I wish, um, you know, the only thing is, um, I wish I was able to have a conversation with Nipsey about um, the color of wealth report mm -hmm. and, and where black yeah, people are right. in, in terms of wealth, right? Most of us are not able to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and, his, and his, um, his absence, it leaves a, a major void in our community and people miss him and miss, miss that presence. But a lot of us have uh, financial difficulties in obtaining that. And like, I really wish that I was able to have that conversation with him. But you know, I really love how he left that fire to to um, really push for young people to really care about our community and do more. You know, I would have loved for him to do a, a get out the vote campaign like and things that, like yeah. that. Yeah, because he really got it. He really understood it. He was in multiple talks with Marquise Harris Dawson and um, just really trying to do more. So I think you know, I think Black culture and and hip hop has. Um, you know, a huge place in politics, especially black politics. But it's like, we have to get on the right messaging. We have to be anchored in the right data and pushing right. certain narratives. Because now buying back the block, like kind of is something that Nipsey has left, but buying back the block doesn't anchor itself in um, how do we get access to that capital? Because mm -hmm. lack of access to capital is why we cannot buy back the block. Right, you know? right, right. But because again, like you just don't have the capital or the funds to then do it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But if there was some type of, not trust, but say like a Nipsey Hustle bank account or right. something that all of a sudden the <laughs> grease, it, you know, it's greasing the wheels, you know? Yeah, and, 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 it's, and it's just, it's so unfortunate because I feel like he just left such a wonderful legacy and I understand his family's still mourning. The community needs the presence of Nipsey, yeah. right, like right now, and we like saw, last year. Well, well I mean, it, it yeah. was very surprising, or not surprising, it was just I was taken aback, because obviously I would heard about Nipsey, I would listened to his mixtapes and stuff over the past couple years, but then when he died, though, like, the community really came out and showed. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, Kobe, like, obviously is a different level of, of L.A. or whatever, but I, I want, I, like, and Kobe is like a, a you know, a, a giant, like, brand, if you yeah. will. But Nipsey, when he passed, it was so much more at home, you know, so much more in the community that the community really was hurting mm -hmm. out of his lack of presence because he was a rock in that community and yeah. not in terms of, just capital and, and notoriety, but then just being there. The fact that he was around, like a lot yeah, of people, you know, Kevin people Hart, other people that are, or even I think, I, I don't want to say Kevin Hart, don't remember, but I've, I'm trying to think of a good kid, Matt City, mm -hmm. what's his name? Uh, the rapper from Compton. Oh, Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar. Uh -huh. Like, it's like he doesn't live in Compton anymore. I'm right. not saying that that's necessarily you have to. Right. I'm just saying there's a difference of Nipsey saying that I'm going to put my thing in the community yeah. and then do that. Um, so the outpouring of support was really, I don't know, inspiring or? Yeah, no, it, it was definitely um, inspiring. I, w I was not fortunate enough to have met Nipsey. I wish I was able to. Was, you know, I, pretty much all my family members. <laughs> Somehow, did, some way. Yeah, you know, all in the circle. Everybody's got <laughs> pictures with him, you know, and like he was just so... Um, he was just so down to earth and mm -hmm. just so welcoming. And he just did not have that I'm a celebrity vibe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something else that that the the community really missed was to be able to reach out and touch him and mm -hmm. to just show up at his Good store point. and just see him there. Um, and honestly speaking, because you know I had newly moved to LA, it was always so much traffic right there. So I always- oh, Crenshaw I, right there. Crenshaw and yeah, Slauson, yeah, yeah, yeah. but- <laughs> 
yeah, and I didn't recognize it until until after Nipsey passed, and because right. um, my brother was telling me about Black Pack, and he was like, "You need to get with Nipsey Hustle," and I was preparing to present to him wow. the week he was killed, and so it was really wow. it like I went through some real <laughs> emotional trauma. Like this imagine. was my best friend, and it was right. like the more you found out about him and how much he cared about his community, him opening a Vector ninety and really. Um, putting his money where his mouth was mm -hmm. when when it came to taking care of his community and making sure that the youth had the next uh, had access to the next what? um you know um the next big thing as far as like technology and learning the code and right, things right. like that and that it's was like a, who else a is co doing that space, right yeah like the co-working yeah, space yeah, yes like, but the bot i believe uh the bottom floor um i haven't i haven't been inside because it's pretty much been you know locked down uh since he was killed um but there's another floor that actually does the teaching and um, and um, like kind of STEM teaching for for teenagers oh, I see, I see, I see, and I see. to prepare them for uh, careers to go into Silicon Valley. Right. So like and that that's we, major. And it's something to say also that this was just him starting to yes, like just this, this was the first thing he just started. Just to do. starting, you so know. So you can imagine what it could have been. Absolutely, but yeah. I wish many more celebrities actually took responsibility for not only the hood, but like just for the black community. Yeah. Um, a lot of people aren't pouring back into the black community and it's like we could be so much further along if a lot a lot more people were doing that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well so what so I guess like some to go from someone who also so was very in, involved in the black community to someone who basically like is known only for his relationship with the black community is mm -hmm. you hosted a panel discussion a couple months back during COVID uh, mm -hmm. on Malcolm X's ninety fifth birthday. Um, what lessons do we still need to hear from Brother Malcolm in 2012? Oh, that black people are political chumps. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's the message. It's one of the messages. Um, Ballad or the Bullet, his speech, it is so on point right. for what's happening today. And, you know, he talks about basically Democrats and Republicans are pretty much the same thing. We just need to worry about what it is that black people need and what right. we're going to have to make class. demands. capital class. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about capital. Mm -hmm. Um... Uh, and, and about obtaining our freedom by any means necessary. You know, right. Malcolm X mentioned, um, I forgot it was an interview, but someone asked him like, um, what is the what is the, the biggest risk for justice and he's, or freedom? He said is death. Like, uh -huh. you gotta be willing to die for this. Right. And we need more people to think like that. And it's interesting, because when I, I scheduled the conversation, it was right, it was way before George Floyd when I scheduled oh, it, yes, but yes, yes. it happened, sure. um, it was scheduled for the day after the uprising started. And the conversation was really anchored in, how do we get people to mobilize and organize and kind of like reignite that fire mm -hmm. of, um, of being revolutionaries? And so it was kind of like, oh, we here now. Now what's the plan? Now what do we need to do? And how right, do we move right. forward? The organization the, of like, this. Yeah, it's like now that we're mobilized, now we got to organize it. Yeah. But it was, the conversation was really how do we mobilize? Because it kind of just felt like everyone's been kind of like, well, complacent, chilling, you know? Like, um, th like 2016 was a really big year, especially for um, uh, Black Lives Matter um, activists. Um, because so many people were killed back to back to back and then the country responded mm. by electing Trump. So <laughs> that was a whole other thing um, that that pretty much um, I felt like it kept feeling like, oh, black people were were getting back up and getting tired of what was happening to us. And it's about to be a revolution and people kind of got comfortable again. But um, the murder, unfortunate murder of uh, George Floyd kind of reignited that. And I just felt Malcolm's spirit there. It was like, this is what we need. We are now mobilized. Now we have to organize it. Now what do we do and how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the, the concert that you mentioned was one of those uh, mechanisms that was supposed to be used to mobilize people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Well, yeah, short of a yeah, concert yeah. and then short of like Malcolm being around, yeah. it really is, um, is that now like, the message is out there because George Floyd, unfortunately, Breonna Taylor, uh, recently as of uh, two days ago, Jacob Blake, mm -hmm. and, and many, many others uh, have reignited a national conversation about race, policing, government. So, I mean, what what has gone well, you know, in that and in, in talking about like maybe what, what would Malcolm say that we're doing well at, and then other things that we oh, still need to, you know, or not just Malcolm, obviously, you know, okay, yeah. and stuff like that. just the movement, because obviously in the last couple months you've seen that. 
the fact that we are still having this conversation, people are still out in the street. Yeah, I mean, the like, police just killed somebody. Know. <laughs> you know, like but, last this, but the apathy Saturday. is not there what it used to be because this was happening even before. But now it's like every weekend there is massive, massive. And you can talk about that, like that could be some election stuff mm -hmm. with Trump, et cetera. But like, yeah. what are the things that are going well in the organization of this kind of movement? And then what are some things that still need to be worked on? Yeah, um, I would think Malcolm would be impressed by um, the allyship that's come about because uh, you know, okay. you know, um, he, sure. you know, he went from being a black separatist, and and I would say that I wouldn't say that he was no longer a black separatist, but I think he he acknowledged that later in life that you know we're kind of all one and connected and um, just brotherly love amongst sure. each other. I think he would really be impressed by the amount of allyship that's come about. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I think so. Definitely, I've been I've been impressed by it. You know, right. like I, <laughs> like I was at one protest, a uh, police car was set on fire by the police. By the way, <laughs> by the police. Um, and a, and a white girl jumped up. She said, "I'll cover you. Go." And I had my speaker box because I was like giving speeches or whatever. She and I think her name was Abby. She was like, "My name is Abby." No, Annie. Annie. She was like, "My name is Annie." Like, Shout and she's like Annie. shielding me. She she became my human shield. I was like, "That's how you ally." Yeah, like, yeah. I loved it. You know, it was really. Um, I was really taken aback. But I think this generation is really tired of the racism yeah. and tired of people being um, bottom casted. And black folks have definitely been bottom casted and. The allyship is just amazing. Um, what needs more work is more um, unity on a black agenda. Mm -hmm. We need to really come to unity on a black agenda. We need to create a code and we need to stay on code. There are too many different black conversations that are happening mm -hmm. that can start canceling each other out. Mm -hmm. And even like Kamala Harris, black woman, supposedly, um, but doesn't necessarily mean she's good for black people. Mm -hmm. I think Malcolm would be disappointed in how many black folks are just like, oh my gosh, she's one of us and we gonna vote for her. Mm -hmm. Knowing her record, the way she's overly incarcerated black men, she's never prosecuted a killer cop. Kept people in death row. Kept too. people in death row. Mm -hmm. um, kept people in prison to continue to staff these, um, these uh, fire camps mm -hmm. for the cheap labor, you know? And these are black people. These are black men. My cousin was in one of these fire camps. Right. That hits too close to home. She's been. She's almost fifty years old. She has no track record of doing anything for black people. We need to be more critical of who we're selecting as our leaders and stop just falling for the okie doke. You know, mm. he talked in Ballad of the Bully. He talks about uh, basically black places and high and high pla black faces in high places who are still used to push a, a white supremacist agenda. Sure. I think he would be very critical of black people not doing politics correctly in terms of we don't need to be blue or red. Our politics need yeah. to be black and we need to focus on the needs of the black community and not just keep allowing, as he would say, Uncle Tom's um, in here to just be fake leaders for well, us. Well, not to bring up again what happened last night, but the Re Re Republican National Convention was on and who spoke first? I mean, or, or who watched the, that? I well, I, I saw it on Twitter. <laughs> was uh, Herschel Walker. You know, he was a big time football player, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, for the University of Georgia. And he's right. one of the first people to, and it's like, how are you aligning with that? But at the same time, like personal politics, et cetera, we can't get it. But at the same time, I can, I can see that that critical voice of Malcolm would be, you know, Th throwing critique around yeah. pretty pretty uh, easily. Yeah, I like, guess you could he, say. like he compares the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. He says the Republican Party is the wolf. You notice the wolf. You know it's vicious and and yada oh, yada. Yes, yes, yes. And and the Democrat Party is the fox. Like they they slick and they're gonna convince you, but they're gonna help walk you to your own demise too. They're just going to <laughs> they're just going to mask it differently right. but they because they're get slick. A something on the side right. to do that. Right. Or, yeah. or 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 uh, kind of like. Like like feed you carrots as they walk you into oh, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> into they the walk death you dungeon to the, to the to the lion's mouth <laughs> yeah. like okay like just because you gave me carrots don't make you make you nicer you just took me to the to the uh, to the lion's mouth on right. a detour and the wolf just took me directly there right. but they still you still got to the same place right. you know so like I think Malcolm would be very critical of the way we're doing politics right now. And we're not um, we're not asking for specific things. Uh, when I ran for city council, I met someone who's a Republican, and I wouldn't say we, our our um, issues are in alignment, but it was like oh, okay, like 
it just made me think that, oh, well, maybe not all Republicans are bad. Like, I feel like their historical context is, is an issue. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we don't have in-depth enough conversations. We just really are party? Oh, hell no. Democrat? Hell no. Uh, Republican? Hell no. Like, I don't, mm. th I think that the conversation deserves more nuance mm. and we're not having it. Sure. Well, I think black folks just should be independent and just make people court our votes. We're not doing that. We need to be uh, non-party affiliates so that they come and court our votes. Because right now we're considered a captured electorate for the Democratic Party, which makes them feel like they don't have to do anything for us which is why they won't give us a black agenda right now. Yeah, and a specific thing that does rights these ills that right. we've been talking about. Um, so we talked, we mentioned MLK, we mentioned some other uh, visionary thinkers. Um, James Baldwin, Fred Hampton Jr., and Toni Morrison were kind of my baptism into black thought and literature. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of popular books around right now yeah. regarding this. Uh, so White Fragility, um, Robin D'Angelo, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, and the older ones such as Race Matters by Cornel West, and mm -hmm. then Are Prisons Obsolete by Angela Davis. Um, who, were some, who were some of the voices that we could amplify maybe for listeners for more research or to, to kind of think of that? Because we, we've talked about some of the big ones but yeah. and, and skirted around some other ones. But what are some other big voices that maybe you know we should be honing in on a little voices. bit more um as far as who would be the audience or, or, or even is, are, is it we, good to even read those how to be an anti-racist like or is it hey like it's it's good to read but then there's like, the x y and z i think i think a, a dr sandy darity or a william darity i know they do call him sandy but i think his book is under his name william darity um, he wrote from uh, Here to Equality, okay. or him and his partner, actually. And he discusses, like, the entire background of the plight of black people mm -hmm. and how we've been economically disadvantaged and gives the entire formula for reparations. Mm -hmm. I think people should definitely read that book. Um, there is a Color of Law, and it talks about how we were discriminated against and um, and just pretty much, I wouldn't say addressing reparations, but... Uh, it gives certain prescriptions for how we can make it right and mm. it and helps to quantify exactly like the amount of wealth that black people have been locked out of. I can't remember the author's name at this moment, but um, it's a Jewish white guy. He did a, he did a great job on that book. Um, what? Who else? Um, uh, Yvette Carnell on YouTube. She is amazing. Um, Antonio Moore on YouTube, he's great also. And, and they're authors too in their own right, and they write articles mm -hmm. and they publish them. But um, they really help to contextualize the existence of black people in, or ADOS people in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, the com comparison and contrast with um, immigrants. And not in, a, in an immigrant bashing way, it's just a real um, critical look at the way the con country is using them as a buffer class and not to um, do anything for black mm -hmm. people. And that's the issue, you know? Um, I would add to yeah. um, Great Migration, Isabella Wilkerson. Okay. I, I listened to her and that was basically all about how like, after slavery um, is ended, basically then you have a phenomenon of sharecropping, mm -hmm. which is basically slavery light. Oh yeah, you know? uh, and, sl uh, slavery by another name. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, what's that author's name? I can't think at this moment. Um, slavery by another name. Um, What's her name? Michelle Alexander for. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thir uh, not, not thirteenth. It's the New Jim Crow. The New Jim she, Crow. She wrote that's the right. New Jim that's, Crow, that, that's and, a great, and which that's really great became the thirteenth documentary. Yep. Um, yeah, and and Slauson Girl, Slauson Girl speaks in her <laughs> podcast because she's really in tune with what's happening right now in South Central, and she she does a lot of great stories on South Central, and uh, she has a great blog. So well, one of the things that in Great Migration side, again, like you 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 come out across this information, and it's just like, how the fuck did I not know about this? Mm -hmm. And it talks about how like. Basically, um, absolutely sharecropping. Oh, well, no, not just sharecropping, but how it happened in the Jim Crow in the, mm -hmm. the migration of black people out of the South. Oh, yeah. In the like, basically from like the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, so like 1915 to like 1965. Mm -hmm. Basically, there was a giant influx to communities like New York, Chicago, and Los, Los Angeles. Angeles yeah. Huge from, and that basically it, it tells the story of a couple of these specific and, and over their lifetimes. And it is a trip to think about how, again, 
that you would go, you would leave, you know, a plantation or something of sharecropping mm -hmm. and then, you know, for saying something, like not doing exactly what you need to be doing, not being a great worker. And then you would literally be possibly lynched, which yeah. was happening a lot around the time to no consequences. Right. So then you leave and go to New York, Chicago or LA, but then through home ownership and redlining and stuff, you're put into a ghetto, you're put into a district. Mm -hmm. And then again, we talk about this intergenerational non-wealth. Well, then that's how, how would you start? You start from scratch okay. and some of them make it, but then a bunch of them don't. Right. And then the other ones who do make it are an exception that proves the rule. Right. So it's a very interesting kind of dynamic of how, again, like these people literally left a, a fucked up situation to then just to get to a new messed up situation. Yeah, you know? absolutely. But, <laughs> and, and a lot of my family was a part of that great migration. My mother's from Chicago, so right. her, her folks okay. went there. Sure, and sure. then my mother came, um, my mother came here. My grandfather actually came to Los Angeles. But um, yeah, they were able to at least work and get a check. But right. you know, they to were still- To survive. To survive, <laughs> but they were still locked out of certain types of jobs and union jobs and, um, Industrial oh, for jobs, sure, for yeah, sure. definitely, yeah. So, yeah, it's a major. That's a that's a really good point, definitely. So, great um, migration. I, I feel like there's a yeah. new great migration. Um, you know, a lot of these cities, like blue states, right? And I'm a registered Democrat. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think, <laughs> unfortunately, no. <laughs> I'm a registered Democrat, but I'm very critical of the Democratic Party. It's like when you as look any at, good citizen should right. be. Like, I don't understand how this is like a negative thing. Right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people like whenever I make this point, people go, "Are you a Republican?" Like, no. I'm, I'm not. A free thinking I am, I'm a free He's thinking. And, I'm not Kanye free thinking, <laughs> but <laughs> touche, touche, touche. I'm a critical thinking individual. But when you look at all these cities that have high homelessness and um, you know, overpriced housing, these are blue cities, mm -hmm. blue states. Well, that's been and they're relocating us to red cities. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, um, I think it's a plan to flip red states. When you send a bunch of Democratic people who are priced out of these Democratic states. It's gonna start flipping states. Mm. That's so what, that's kind of the that's what I think. That's my theory. I don't have no studies to support. It, that <laughs> is my that theory. Down. Yeah, I believe it. Um, so, so then let's get back to I guess like what what um, the biggest kind of message that we want to impart from the, from this, other than just talking about again knowledge and and getting this information out is um, you started this uh, organization called Black Pact, mm -hmm. and so it's basically an organization organization now trying to become a PAC, a political action committee. So a PAC is basically you can, a political action committee can give anywhere between $5,000 to any one candidate for any election and then $15,000 annually. And then a super PAC is one that can get indefinite, unlimited, unlimited mm -hmm. uh, campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. So basically the idea is that you're committed to creating a social contract among black American descendants of slaves, ADOS that we talked about, uh, to be politically, economically, and socially responsible for one's interest, uh, for another's interest as... Uh, for each other's interest. Oh, for each other's, yeah. excuse me, excuse me, as a, collect, a cultural collective. So we make a pact to organize the masses of our peoples to allies, to push a political agenda that not only represents the members of our organization, but to work against policies that adversely affect our communities. So before we get to the single goal and like mm -hmm. the five kind of points that we have, um, what were kind of the surrounding circumstances? Like what kind of made you, I, obviously we talked about you running, but mm -hmm. then to set up a, an organization and do the whole nine and yeah. paperwork, what, what kind of spurred that on? Um, pretty much, I started Black Pack the day after Donald Trump was elected. <laughs> <laughs> and and for me, it was more so, cause you know, you know, I, I had quite a few drinks when he was elected, when nah. it was announced <laughs> and I held my son in my arms and I just cried like, and I apologized to him to what this country just did to him mm. in terms of like, this is your response. Somebody who was just saying, basically be tougher on criminals and things like that. After we just had a string of uh, police involved shootings of right. like, black people, black men specifically. And and it was just, something has to be done. And something has to be done to bring black folks together for us to aggregate our funds, yeah. push our candidates, and push an agenda. If people were not happy with Hillary Clinton, it should have been known, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like for, for folks to not just come out. And then of course we later find out it was all this Russian, Russian propaganda and, and all these other things. But I just felt like, 
we need a central place where we come to get our politics we look over the candidates and we um, decide who we're going to endorse and all black folks in the community get this memo or your slate of who to vote for mm -hmm. um, in your specific area and we'll have our money to push certain candidates because too many people are afraid to say black Mm, yeah. Too many people. But we continue to do politics for all of these other people and it's adversely affecting us. You know, mm -hmm. um, even uh, when you think about the 1964 um, Civil Rights Bill and how they um, how that was kind of the catalyst for the immigration bill. Ah, uh, yes. OK. You have a lot of immigrants who come here who are not only anti-black, they're anti-black politics and they fight black Americans on affirmative action. Mm -hmm. It's like. How do you reconcile the two? It's and it's it's fine that certain uh, communities have their own specific politics. Sure, there's going to be tension. But we're the only ones who who do politics for everyone else, right, and no right, one right. and everyone else doesn't do politics for us. Right. So we have to actually start getting on board with doing politics specifically for us. Yeah. So and then so, so well that so specifically yes yeah, spe let's go into that those. specificity is is why Black Pack exists um, and and why I started it because. We needed people who were not going to be afraid to say black and black politics and, and help fix the ills in the black community specifically right. because they were specifically done to us. Yeah, and it's not platitudes or narratives. It's, right. it's literally, we're I'm putting my money where my mouth is. We're, right. we're literally put, having skin in the game in our community. Right, like they just passed, um, uh, well, it's not passed. It's going to be on the ballot to uh, re um, basically to amend the state constitution to allow for racial preferential treatment for um, oh, government contracts, re reinstating uh, affirmative action. Mm -hmm. um, we need that. You know, when people think they're, you know, people think this is a meritocracy and that, you know, you should be able to just work your way up. But yeah, but you're removing the historical context of how yeah. black people specifically were locked out of participation. You can't expect us all to be at the same level and perform at the same level when we've been under-resourced. Yeah, that's so funny. It's people, like, how, how yeah. can you pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you, you don't ain't have got any no boots. <laughs> yeah, I ain't got or no boots. boots. No straps or boots. No straps or boots. <laughs> so that's that's a rude statement to yeah, make. Yeah, yeah, so right, right. so yeah, that's that's why I created Black Pack, and because we need to not be afraid of that anymore. And a lot of people are afraid of it is because they're getting money from other folks and they don't want to upset them. Mm -hmm. You know, even Karen Bass. You know, um, she was bold enough to say it. She said, "Oh no, we don't say black because uh, don't won't nobody touch it." If right, you say black in there, and we want to change, and we're, we're we want to change that narrative, and we're going to, and the the fear of saying black is partly why we got George Floyd. Yeah, you know, someone yeah. like George Floyd exists because we're not doing black politics. We're not we're not trying to make whole these black men who are coming out of prison, who um, you know, who who can't find a job and who can't take care of their kids, and you know whether they engage in drugs like. It's traumatized in being a black person in this country. I'm not surprised by the, the rates in which we engage in um, alcohol and drugs and things like that. It's a lot of trauma. Seeing all of these deaths and, black, and, um, and police killing black people, it's very traumatizing. Yeah, for but, even but, but we are continue to be uh, penalized for it. White people do drugs just the same. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I, not to, I even tweeted this with uh, Jacob Blake. Um, his uh no sorry yeah jacob blake his uh three kids were in the car when he was shot and it's like how, can you put a dollar amount on the trauma of those kids again like i don't know how you can economically even justify even sending a cop there to the yeah. institute because then the harm that was done rather than the what you were trying to break up a, right. a house fight a, a fight that a good samaritan was breaking it up yeah. and then he just doesn't want to listen to you because he, he becomes knows, a vi he, yeah. he becomes a suspect exactly and, exactly yeah. It's unfortunate, but also the mindset of that cop to where you don't even consider these children. No, you, no, exactly. You don't consider yeah. their safety. You don't, like, not, not even like just the trauma, you don't even consider the fact that you could have shot one of his children yeah. or a bullet could have ricocheted and hurt one of them. Well, it's, I think it, it, it all, it's and the, I'm, not, I'm not justifying, but it, it mm -hmm. seems like it's an it's a occupying force, like a war. Like you are the enemy and you are the other. And yeah. literally, it doesn't matter. And your about, children are too. Yep. Yeah, they, they definitely don't take the... the 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 human the human into consideration right yeah well then t taking back the human into consideration <laughs> yeah. is what black pack's trying to do so let's go Absolutely. through this uh you have kind of a five prong thing and obviously there's more but these five i think really speak to kind of what you're trying to do and then also the mechanisms of mm -hmm. literally what's been happening so we are driven by a single goal 
to push a political agenda that addresses the specific ills forced into our communities through slavery, the Reconstruction Era, Jim Crow, redlining, and the prison industrial, comp uh, industrial complex. So and let's take each one of those, I guess, as, as a singular thing. Mm -hmm. uh, slavery. So we talked a lot about ADOS and, and righting those wrongs or having a type of um, reconciliation commission of some sort on a national level. So mm -hmm. like, is there any other things that you would say in terms of slavery? Like what are some other goals or things around that goal? That uh, you... In terms of like the redress for it? Like well, yeah. So let's go through each one. And so it's like slavery would be and, and uh, ADOS becoming more of a prevalent thing, mm -hmm. you know, and then also a, re or a reconciliation about slavery in general, you know, that, so what, are there any other kind of real specific things that we could do to, to, I mean, cash reparations, absolutely. <laughs> Just bring the bag and we'll talk later. Bring you know? the bag. Yeah, um, yeah um, definitely um, just like like we discussed before in terms of like the census and ADOS being census, a more, okay. Very good the point. ADOS being a much more prevalent uh, movement and that people who are American descendants of slavery, it is important that you are counted as such because we have to actually get a real glimpse of where we are as a people. Yeah. Uh, that's important. Um, and then from that actual reparations, uh, we need to we need to figure out who will actually get them. And it will be American descendants of slavery who um, who have have um, identified as black on all of their official documents mm -hmm. for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't get to be a white person who has black somewhere down the line in your in your family. You get to say that's like, not the oh, point. That's that we're trying definitely to make. not the point. Yeah, it's yeah. about really righting the wrongs of this country in the way that this country has financially broken us and 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 um, locked us out of. Uh, economic participation with slavery mm -hmm. and refused to make us whole because of it. And a lot of people currently still are living off of the wealth made from slaves. Sure. And that, well, then that goes into the reconstruction era of mm -hmm. like, what are some of the things? Because I mean, the wealth that was created after slavery was, but still in white pockets. You right. Know? And so, I mean, they gave reparations to the slave owners who lost their property. Right. They reimbursed them money for losing their slaves. Yeah. Um, and then we were supposed to, during the Reconstruction era, we were supposed to get 40 acres and a mule. We did not get that. Right. No because totally. had we had we been able to get that, we would have been able to um, uh, farm our own lands and own our own products and actually engage in um, contracting. Uh, the Civil Rights Law of 1866 uh, gave us that right to um, engage in commerce and, and be able to have contracts. Mm -hmm. But we ain't had no property and no land yeah. to do it. Well, that 40, there was a great Radio Lab episode about that 40 acres and a mule, and then mm -hmm. also the Tulsa black, you know, the right. black stock and market. Right. And even Tulsa, Tulsa which yeah. was in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. That's another, what, 40, 50 years. Well, then that goes after into Jim Crow. Slavery. And yeah, yeah and definitely, okay. and then Jim Crow. But it was like black people have always been resourceful and, um, and um, persistent. You know, we, we, we always had that drive, but when you have a, a, a system that is constantly beating us down and will snatch the rug from up under us every time we try, mm -hmm. it can be defeating. And I feel like we're kind of on the end when, we, when you see there's 50% of the homeless, we're on the defeated end. Yeah. You know, uh, granted, not everyone is, but it's like our numbers are extremely too high. It's, 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 a, it's a state of urgency right now. Right. And then so specifically, so then Jim Crow is the next, and the, like specifically with Jim Crow, that was more in the 60s, but then like you said, Michelle Alexander is, uh, she said the new Jim Crow, and that's more about incarceration. Incarceration. That's, and we'll get to the prison industrial complex, but basically the idea is the 13th Amend Amendment is supposed to basically say, hey, everyone's not a slave. Like, right, and it's, it's, supposed it's, it's supposed to. supposed to. But what it does do. Clause, <laughs> it says, actually, if you're committed from a crime, this is not necessarily right. what it is. So, I basically uh, think that, um, well, the Jim Crow kind of the resurgence of that, and then mm -hmm. Michelle Alexander really shined a light on on some of that resurgence. So, is there any other specific kind of policies for or mm -hmm. other things that specifically Jim Crow, um, or is that more tied in with the prison industrial complex as well? I mean, like when we when we discuss these things, we talking to, we're talking about the actual harm that's been done to us, yes. and that is a crude disadvantage between slavery to now. So, like, if we were able to have our own farms and things like that, like the amount of interest that all of that would have, um, oh, the compounding, the compounding about, yeah, yes, interest yes, 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 that yes. would have came came about, how how um, further along black people would be economically would not exist had these um, atrocities did not mm -hmm. happen specifically to us as a people. So it's an accrued disadvantage. So 
So, you know, you owe us some money. <laughs> you know, it's like beyond economic lockout. Because even the crack epidemic, while we're already financially fractured, you didn't you th- you then crack bomb us. Yeah. And the the actual government, the CIA, actually helps put this crack in our communities. So y'all to help you guys pay for a war that Congress said no to. Yeah. It's you, all interconnected. I, I mean, yes, yeah, definitely yeah. interconnected, but it's like you already took an economically disadvantaged people. Then you hook them on drugs. Yeah. Specifically in our and community. Then, you get then overly incarcerate them to yeah. continue yep. to allow for slave labor. Yeah. It's like you're using us. We are the shoes that America ran this race on. Yeah. You know totally, what I mean? Totally. Like, And we're tore up. Right. You have to repair us. Well, and the redlining specifically, I think, is one of the mechanisms that, that can, I guess you could say, like, you can see real changes that like in a re- redlining is basically the the housing authority of any city basically said when these new immigrants or these new black people were coming in is at this line you don't sell you know what i mean for white families you can sell mm-hmm. or, or buy property and stuff right. but if you go over here and it's blacks no selling so then literally there's no home ownership there's no like wealth at- attainment etc in the in those kind of areas and i think like redoing those redlining policies to then open up housing and stuff like that. I mean, that goes beyond just black people. I mean, that's like if affordable housing is needed mm-hmm. for everybody. Well, <laughs> like, I mean, but but I'm not trying to say, I, I, I'm just saying like specifically. Did but you just re- all lives matter reparation? No. <laughs> affordable housing. No, well, I mean, I'm just saying that there's a lot of, the, well, the affordable housing is needed in the inner city and that mostly happens because of the redlining from previous like political you know, people of white, you know, white people in power saying at this juncture over here, you don't, you don't do anything over mm-hmm. here. You do do something. It's like, but it's the same capital. It's the same amount of things, but literally just the access is taken away. Well, what if the access was given, mm-hmm. you know, and then all of a sudden something can happen. So I don't know if that's specifically a mechanism uh, or not, but that it's, it seems like uh, that that could be something that could change. Yeah, so. no, I mean, definitely. But um you know, I know a lot of people need affordable housing, but specifically black people. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like when we talked about homelessness, those numbers are atrocious. Okay. I, yeah, when when you look so, at 40% yep. of the black, uh, of, of the homeless are black, then, but we're only 8% of the, the totally. just the LA County's population. Those are ridiculous numbers. That is a major disparity that has to be mm-hmm. repaired. And, and it shows the level of prioritization that the black community needs. Or the ADOS community needs, because you know that's usually who's out there. Right, right, right. And so, lastly, uh, the prison industrial complex. So mm-hmm. this is probably the biggest out of all of them uh, for something to do. So this has wide-ranging implications. So not only is prison and policing uh, a part of this country, yeah. um, it has disproportionately been black people that are getting incarcerated. So mm-hmm. again, around the same numbers of. Uh, Crimes, same number of drug usage, et cetera. But then, you know, we have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. Mm-hmm. And most of those people being, dis- uh, you know, people of color. So yeah. let's talk Not about... Not people of color. Uh, well, black people. Black people, or, specifically. Okay. And people. then, and then yeah. so, so one of the things, though, is uh, like we can talk... I don't want to get too far into like, you know, Joe Biden or the crime bill or anything. But let's yeah. talk like specific things like... Mandatory sentencing. Mm-hmm. That was something, you know, in the war on drugs that was huge on, on, on things of like mandatory sentence, like three strikes you're out laws right. and things like that. Um, the 13th Amendment, as we talked about, is that you can be in a, a prisoner and then literally be working on the front lines of a fire. And in California, that's around all the time now, you yeah. know, and so you're not getting paid any money, so you're effectively a slave and now. And it's a dangerous job, and yeah. But, absolutely. Uh, cash bail. That's another thing. A lot of people are held in pretrial hearings that literally just because you don't have money or capital to then basically appease the ju- judicial system, and then white people mostly do. Well, then they're out, uh, out, out, you know, doing whatever for their trial. But mm-hmm. then black people are incarcerated until they can either a pay for their bill or b their trial date. Right. And it's like that alone is a giant percentage of the population. Right. Um, the fact that for profit. You know, things exist, not just in the prison systems, but then also phone calls, commissary, visitation, (laughs) even even probation and even house arrest. Like you have to pay to get an ankle bracelet. Right. (laughs) It's like it's it's, it's 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 a it's a fee. Right. Right. It's it's a way for like we talked about 13th Amendment, allow the loophole to continue slavery. But 
this country is just using us to make money. And then even with the crime bill, as we mentioned earlier, it incentivized the not only the continued creation of more prisons, but the requirement to populate those prisons. Right. No, you're, no, absolutely. you're going to search for these people some kind of way. And when yep. black folks have already been bottom casted, you don't feel like you have to do for us. You do feel like you can come into our communities over police us, beat us, kill us, shoot us. Breonna Taylor us case. They just perfect they, example. They just shot up in, in into her apartment with no regard to human life for her and her her, her boyfriend. Any of the neighbors. Yeah, and wasn't it something about like a cannabis, like a, a marijuana, something, something for drugs? And it's like that was the reasoning it's for. Still, but, but still, no knock raise and just shooting around. Like it still is. It still does not. Their response do not fit the crime. Right. Even it, the guy. Regardless. Even the guy in the Wendy's um, who fell asleep in the drive-through. This was during the uprising oh, right. when they yeah, set yeah, the I Wendy's that. on fire. Yeah. I can't think of his name at the moment, but they shot and killed him. Although he resisted arrest. He was he was drinking. He said he was drinking. He could not. Um, he said, "Can I call my girlfriend to come pick me up?" They said no. He said, "Live around the corner. Can I walk home?" They said no. Why not? Yeah. Let this man go home. Yeah. He takes your taser. Like to go to jail is going to cost you so much money. Right, but they he, see that as right, an of course. Trip. And it's like you're using these people to continue yep. to bring money into your system. Yeah. You know, we you can't we can't continue to allow this. We have to take the operations of money or the incentive of money out of out of prisons, out of um, policing. Right. Like we have to. It should not. It should not. It should not be a. It should not be a racket. Right. And that's what it is. Yeah, because the idea is that we're rehabilitating the community. If you mess They're up, not, there's, you go, no there's no rehabilitation. I know people who are in prison. They can't even get classes anymore. I, I think there are like a few. There, there are a few colleges that allow for home study for prisoners, cost thousands of dollars. Who has that money? And they don't qualify for financial aid. Yeah. They can't fill out a FAFSA. Right, 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 because you're automatically barred. And right. we're not even talking about the November we're election not, that's coming up. Right. That then they're not allowed to vote either if you have a felony record. Exactly. Et cetera, et cetera. Right. We're not even, we're not even rehabilitating the people to prepare them to come back out. We are, or not even we, the prison industrial complex is, is uh, making sure uh, to increase recidivism so that they have prisoners to still come back to right. um, to you know to make their money and to fill these beds it's it's unfortunate and black men they are although you said 25% of the world's uh, population no, I, that prison, was more uh, no sorry that was just Americans no no, no that's yeah, what I'm America, saying okay, I'm yeah. saying out of that 25% okay, yeah, yeah. black men there are more black men incarcerated in this country than all women in the world right all women in the world right that's crazy and we're crazy. still only thir we're thirteen percent of the population, so black men are what six and a half. Right, and you're and it's not even like we're we're we're, we're just trying to get to e like like much less like justice like justice. just just to the equalness of like Look, that is going to be justice a and and equality. I, we need right. both. You know, it's not enough just to allow a black men out of prison. About no, you have to start making us whole. You have to start repairing us because we will no longer continue to just be the shoes that y'all run this race on. Yvette Carnell, that's her quote. I love it. I feel like it, it definitely helps to visualize mm -hmm. the way America has used black people in this Very country, or ADOS people, to yeah. definitely, you know, fuel the the financials of this country. Very well put. Um, so basically, last thing, uh, I always ask this question to all my guests. Um, mm -hmm. The overview effect is a... Uh, it's like a transcendent-like experience of seeing the Earth from space. So astronauts always, like, there's only been 500 people that have been up in the space out of, mm. like, 10 billion people that have ever existed, humans. And when they come back down to Earth, they are, like, it's, the you know, an incredible experience, the you know, whole nine. And so I like to ask every guest, like, what is one thing you would like to say or a piece of knowledge that you would like to impart, say, if you were the astronaut and looking down at Earth? So, like, if you had the opportunity, what, what would you say? Am I speaking to the astronaut or, uh, everyday, no, the or Earth, everyday people? The okay, the people. Okay. The people. <laughs> I mean, he's there, you know what okay. I mean? Or she's there. <laughs> They're in there somewhere. <laughs> They're in there somewhere. Um, I would say to see the human in the the human in black people. Mm. Um, don't like really do your research. Really know your history and know the history of black people and our, our valuable contributions to this country mm -hmm. and um, the way that this country has beaten us down and used us like before you judge us. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, that is what I definitely stress because I, we have so many conversations and his, historical context is lost. You know, mm-hmm. they look at people who are gang members in the streets or who are uh, drug dealers and it's like, look, but when the government does not invest in your communities, when there's no money, when people have to feed their kids, a lot of people don't understand that a lot of that life is survival. And granted, there are also black doctors and lawyers and things like that. Those are the exceptions and not the rule because you know, yes, we because we still have that drive. Yeah. You know, we still have that beauty in us as a people, and we still have valuable contributions. This country and and other countries imitate our art that we create. Sure. You know, sure. our culture. Like we are a creative, loving people, and we are this way, just naturally. We love pretty much everybody. That's why we fight for everyone. It's time to start loving black people. That's I what like I that. challenge people. Oh, it's time to start loving, time to start black, loving people. black people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thanks for coming on Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations, yeah. Tara. Uh, I'm Nicholas McKay, and until next time, at Astra.